Oh, well, it wasn't on. Testing. Works. <laughs> You need to use this one, right? I think so. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, the afternoon air quality session. So I'm Ling Zhang from uh, Peking University. Now we have uh, seven very interesting uh, presentations. Our first one is uh, uh, Adina uh, Morris from University of uh, York. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the work that we've been doing simulating air pollution in West Africa um, using a nested grid in Geoschem. So this work has been done at the University of York, but we'd also like to acknowledge all of the contributions from everybody else that's listed here. So the population in Africa has been increasing rapidly in recent years, and this trend is projected to continue into the future. This is also coupled with increases in urbanization and industrialization, and this is leading to really large increases in the anthropogenic emissions in the region. And these then have large impacts on things such as human health, as well as crop health and agricultural productivity. So there's currently um, quite limited research in this area, um, and this is mainly due to a lack of observational data for the region. So what we're looking to investigate is what's the current distribution of pollution in the region, um, and also how is this gonna change in the future? So there's an EU-funded project called DACOA that's been designed to address these kind of issues and look at improving our understanding and our knowledge of um, the atmosphere and air pollution in West Africa. So the project um, covers a range of different scientific areas and involves 16 different partner organisations from six countries that are across both Europe and West Africa. One of the major activities of the um, project was a field campaign which took place last summer. And this involved both ground-based measurement sites as well as a three-week intensive aircraft campaign that was based out of Lome in Togo. So during the campaign, measurements of gases and aerosols were taken from three different aircraft. So the British Antarctic Survey Twin Otter, the French Sapphire ATR and the German DLR Falcon. And the flight tracks taken by these aircraft are illustrated here on this map. 
What we've been doing is we've been using the coordinates of the aircraft to, use, to run the plane flight diagnostic in Geoschem and simulate these flight tracks, outputting chemical data on a one minute time step along each of the flight tracks so that we can make direct comparisons between the model and the observations. We're interested in both primary pollutants and secondary pollutants, but so far most of our work has been focused just on CO, NOx and ozone. So we're using um, a nested grid for West Africa, which is illustrated here in green. We're running the global simulation at a resolution of 4 by 5 degrees to generate the boundary conditions, and then running the regional simulation at a quarter of a degree resolution, which is illustrated in the right-hand corner for the section of the West African coastline where the research flights took place. We're also interested in updating some of the emission inventories for the region. So currently we've looked at adding the GFAST biomass burning inventory as well as the DICE Africa anthropogenic inventory. So these animations just say this, show the surface level concentrations of some of the pollutants that we're interested in. So for carbon monoxide, we can see these high concentrations from some of the city plumes, particularly from Lagos, as well as high concentrations coming in from the southeast, which is due to biomass burning in Central Africa. For NOx, we can also see fire emissions, city plumes in um, agriculture. And for ozone, we've got these lower concentrations over the land due to dry deposition, as well as high concentrations from biomass burning and from city plumes. So there's different inventories that we can use in our model, but currently for anthropogenics, we're looking at EDGAR and at DICE. For biomass burning, we're looking at GFED and GFAS. Um, for biogenics, we're using MEGAN, and we've also got lightning both in the regional model and in the, in the boundary conditions. So firstly, looking at the carbon monoxide comparisons. So we've run a number of different simulations using different combinations of the inventories, and those are shown in color with the observations in black. So looking at the EDGAR simulations, we can see these generally give us relatively good agreements to the observations. If we switch off the biomass burning, we can see that the concentrations are significantly reduced, which shows us that the biomass burning is having a huge contribution to the carbon monoxide concentrations in the region. We've also run a simulation using the DICE inventory, which currently appears to be showing much higher concentrations of CO, but we think that this is an implementation problem adding the inventory into HEMCO, so we're currently working to correct this at the minute. Moving on to look at nitrogen oxides. So what we're seeing for the NOx is that, in general, the model is underestimating um, the NOx by a factor of about three in comparison to the observations. What we think could be the cause of this is that the um, high temperature combustion sources are being not represented in the inventories that we're using. Or it could be that the high temperature combustion activities in the region have increased since the inventories were constructed. So we still have more work to do to look into the NOx and see what's happening here. So finally, looking at the ozone, depending on which emission inventories we use, we get quite a large variation in the ozone concentrations. If we look at the latitude plot in the center, we can see that at the lower latitudes, which are over the ocean in this um, region, we can see that the model is overestimating the concentrations. And we think that this is probably due to missing halogen sinks. So at the minute, the version of the model that we're using doesn't have the halogen chemistry in, but we will be putting it into future simulations. Um, further north in the region, we're also seeing an overestimation, which we think could be due to underrepresented dry deposition. So to conclude, we are using a regional model um, for West Africa, and we're looking at adding different inventories in to, um, both for biomass burning and for anthropogenics. What we've seen from our initial simulations is that the model seems to be doing a relatively good job at representing the carbon monoxide. However, the nitrogen oxide is significantly underestimated, and we think this is potentially due to high temperature combustion sources. We're also seeing that the ozone is sensitive to the emission inventories that we use, and we may have problems at the minute with the halogen chemistry and with the dry deposition. So thank you for your attention, and I'll take any questions. Thank you. It's exciting to see the West African national model. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have time for a few questions. Yeah. Are you able to compare the NOx values that you're getting during this campaign to the NOx values from the AMA campaign? So we do have the data from the AMA campaign available. We've not yet looked into um, comparing those because we've just run the plane flight for the Dakawa flights at the minute. But it is something that we could do is to look at the concentrations that we were seeing during AMA and see if they're in agreement with what we were seeing during Dakar. Any other questions? Is this region not selected or will see the meeting? Um, 
NOx is underestimated, but ozone is too high? Uh, yes, so I'm not 100% sure. Um, so we only just run these initial simulations, and we haven't yet done any of the analysis on the VOC data, but that is something that we're going to be doing. So we also have aerosol data and VOC data. So we have got a lot more work to look into all of the compounds and really sort of unpick what's happening. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker is uh, Rob Jim Park from Seoul National University. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to use this opportunity to advertise the Chorus AQ uh, field mission which occurred in Korea. Uh, May, June last year. And this course mission is a joint effort between uh, National Environment, Institute of Environmental Research in Korea and NASA in the United States with many researchers from university and other institutions. And primary goals of these uh, missions are to improve capability for satellite remote sensing of air quality. And this goal is in particular important for us because our geostationary satellite uh, Environmental Satellite Mission, which is led by the Professor Jun Kim sitting over there, has started almost a decade ago and is expected to launch the instrument in 2019. And also, using an integrated observation from satellite, aircraft, and ground monitor will help us to test and improve model simulation of air quality. So, uh, for the mission, uh, three research aircraft were used. So, NASA DC-8 provided an extensive observation of gas and aerosol species. And also, NASA King Air carried a Geotasso instrument, which is a similar instrument to GEMS, which will be uh, launched in 2019 on geost geostationary orbit. And also, Korean Hansa King Air aircraft that carried a, a simple payload to measure the uh, ozone and PM and the precursors. And also we have the eight super sites uh, over the whole peninsula and which provide extensive observation of air quality in surface air. And two research vessels extended our observations to the nearby oceans. And also uh, Leo satellite actually provide uh, important information during the mission, but also we have a uh, geostationary ocean, ocean color imager which provide uh, hourly aerosol optical depth information. And also a number of Korean and U.S. air quality model forecasts uh, were provided and were used to direct air flight observations. So as a summary, uh, more than 100 research groups participated in the mission and also an extensive uh, flight observation were carried out and both ground and remote sensing observations were conducted throughout the whole peninsula. And also two research vessels extended our observation to a nearby sea. And uh, about uh, 10 modeling groups uh, participated in uh, this mission. So as a modeler, and our group actually uh, participated in this mission using GeoSCAM. And then let me talk about the preliminary result of model comparison with uh, observation. So this is a daily surface PM 2.5 concentration averaged over the whole peninsula during the mission. And it's sort of the model intercomparison study. And I'm actually comparing the GeoSCAM with the other regional models. And in this case, I used the GeoSCAM nested version with quarter degree resolution. So as you can see, that actually most models have some capability to reproduce daily PM2.5 concentration. And among models, GeoSCAM shows the best result in terms of uh, normalized mean bias, also root mean square error. And then this is, again, uh, daily surface PM2.5 at Olympic Park, which is uh, situated in the center of Seoul, and Seoul is our capital city where more than 10 million people live. So in this case also, GeoSCAM, which is indicated in red, actually captures the daily PM2.5 variability quite well, except for the period uh, under the stagnant uh, synaptic condition. So in this period, actually, actually observation shows that gradual increases in PM2.5 concentration, but model completely failed to capture that increase. So this will be another interesting uh, subject for investigation. And but overall, actually, model generally reproduced the observed daily PM2.5 concentration, and we wonder actually is this for right reason? And as you might expect, the answer is no. So. <laughs> 
So when you first look at the nitrate, and uh, earlier presenter already alluded to, so model grossly overestimate nitrate aerosol concentration, but our PM2.5 concentration looked okay, and why? And that's because OA, organic aerosol is considerably underestimated in the model, and organic aerosol underestimation actually cancels out nitrate overestimation in the model. And my graduate student, Sunan Lee, will give a poster presentation on this issue this afternoon. So the question is, what is missing in the OA simulation? So, <laughs> why? <laughs> so, uh, we, we take a look at it further, and first of all, uh, we look at the black carbon as an indicator of anthropogenic uh, primary emission, and model looked okay. But when we look at the monotropin, which is another important precursor for secondary organic aerosol, surely model underpredicted concentration. But May, June is not warm enough, so monotropin concentration it could not be a big player. But when we look at actually aromatic concentration, like the toluene and benzene, then values are really high. So when you compare the value in the United States, this uh, toluene concentration in Korea is almost an order of higher, order of magnitude higher. So, we did a couple of uh, sensitivity simulation using GeoScan with a BBS approach uh, implemented by Joera and Hojigeda. So, these two sensitivity simulations uh, differ, uh, 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 the difference between these sensitivity simulations and then standard uh, GeoScan model is these sensitivity simulations actually consider the aromatic and uh, so information from aromatics and also is aging. So, this sensitivity simulation shows a bit better result compared to the standard model. But we are still wonder we are doing really right thing. So, <coughs> we didn't observe the organic aerosol concentrations as a function of toluene, then it shows the positive correlation. So, it indicated that actually toluene and aromatic might play an important role in secondary organic aerosol formation. But when we did the same thing using the acetonitrile, then we can see even stronger correlation. So, is, when we look at the uh, whole aircraft observation during the campaign, then there's acetonitrile concentration is pervasive and indicating that actually there's a biomass burning influence. But the problem is that in the model, we don't have any biomass burning influence on organic aerosol. So, right now we are trying to find out where these biomass burning influences are coming from. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just have this one, but we have time for two minutes for questions. So, so in, in Corey's AQ, you were a lot about checking out the satellite observations. Do you see a lot of glyoxal associated with acetylene? Well, yeah, actually, the Mingyang Kim, uh, Professor Mingyang Kim at GIST actually measured the glyoxal on DC8, and she actually presented a, a fair amount of glyoxal concentration, and she actually thought that the secondary organic aerosol might be related to glyoxal, but I have some doubt on that, so <laughs> we'll see. Uh, so, emission inventory for this mission was compiled by the Professor Chang An Wu, who is sitting there, and I think the base year is 2015. Am I correct? Yeah. And when we compare actually what it called propylene aerosol and also total optical depths, then it was okay. Yeah. So, as indicated by the PM2.5 concentration in surface air. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? Or Uh, okay, so Jinta's question is why model will predict the nitrate? And actually, the, my uh, great student, Sungan, will talk about the, this issue a uh, bit detail, but actually, we got the similar conclusion that we had uh, too much total nitrate during the nighttime because of the too rapid N205 uh, heterogeneous chemistry. Mm. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Well, next speaker is uh, uh, Jonathan Mock from Harvard.
this computer. All right, thank you. I'm Jonathan Mock. I'm a graduate student here working with Loretta. And so I'm going to talk today about uh, using the newest version of these geoschem and in situ Chinese uh, air pollution data to try and understand Chinese pollution events. So this is a really important topic for two reasons. One, there's a really dramatic effect of Chinese pollution on regional climate. And you can see just visibility-wise, there's a huge difference. These are pictures from last summer. Uh, near the Institute for Atmospheric Physics, and two is health, the health consequences for Chinese pollution events are really major. Uh, so previous versions of GSChem have shown an underestimate, persistent underestimate, especially in the wintertime in the North China Plain for PM 2.5. Um, but the newest simulation using MARA-2 and the most up-to-date emissions from Tsinghua uh, actually now shows an overestimate of PM2.5. And so the, right the left panel here is uh, information from it zoomed in on eastern China, but there are 29 different sites with monthly mean observations of PM2.5. And what I've done here is this is the seasonal average uh, for winter time compared to uh, the GS chem output. And then on the left is taking the, that square, which we approximate for the North China Plain area, and the six uh, sites in, within that square are plotted over there. So each one of those is one single month. And you can see there's now a really good correlation actually with total PM 2.5, but there's now an overestimate on the seasonal scale in the wintertime. And there's still a, a overestimate for all of China, and it's lower though, driven primarily by the fact that there's a lot of remote sites in Western China in this data set. Uh, so, in terms of the simulation setup that we used, I uh, used MERA-2 meteorology, the nested Asia grid, which is a uh, half degree by uh, 0 0.62 degrees. Um, and we have the newest version 1.2 of the MEIC emissions inventory from Tsinghua University. And so, um, for 2012 and 2013, uh, which we're using to simulate those actual years rather than scaling emissions. Uh, and so one of the, some of the new things about the newest version of the MEIC is that they have this individual power plant database compared to old streets inventory that a lot of people used to use for some of the previous uh, Chinese studies. And they have individual uh, transportation information. And just kind of as a comparison to some standard scaling factors that people have used from the 2010 mix inventory, which is the default in GSChem now, um, there's a little bit lower night NOx emissions in this new inventory, a little bit higher SO2, higher uh, ammonia, and then a little bit lower BC and OC. And so having emissions in China can be very important because emissions are changing pretty rapidly, and they can also change in terms of the spatial distribution. So even if you scale kind of the national emissions, you might be missing some of these changes that happen within the country. Oh, and this is just, those are kind of important. So ammonia is a big difference. So like has been said before, getting PM may be a little high and closer to right, but for the wrong reasons again. And so this is, again, nitrate is really, really overestimated. And so these are the same uh, six sites that I'd shown before. And sulfate is still underestimated in the wintertime, which is something that people have seen before. Um, but the sulfate underestimate is less important than the nitrate overestimate, which ends up dominating the total PM overestimate. And so there are a couple of reasons why nitrate might be so high. Um, one could be this missing sulfate oxidation mechanism that some people have proposed for China. And if there's more sulfate, then there could be less nitrate in the aerosol. Um, another might be that the ammonia emissions are too high, which is allowing more nitrate to go into the aerosol. And then finally, there could be an issue with NOx partitioning. Oh, that's much better. Uh, or a uh, missing NOx sink, uh, such as increasing nitrate deposition from, uh, in the wintertime, such as what Liat and Viral talked about uh, yesterday. So, also, like the larger scale, uh, the reason for these kind of monthly and seasonal overestimates tends to be driven by these extreme events. So, this is um, extreme events and data from surface data from components and total PM in Beijing in December 2011. Uh, and so, you can see here again that the model is now overestimating total PM 2.5. And especially on the uh, extreme, uh, most extreme day, uh, around December 27th or 26th, the PM is really high. And that's driven almost exclusively by this really, really high level of nitrate. Um, there's also high ammonia, but we think that's because there's such high nitrate that it just keeps titrating. Um, and then sulfate is still underestimated a little bit on some of these days, but it's pretty fine, much OK on the normal, uh, on the peak day. Uh, which was interesting to us. And then black carbon, organic carbon are doing all right. 
So switching gears a little bit, but staying on the com uh, idea of black, uh, organic carbon, I'm going to talk a little bit about brown carbon in China, which uh, if the effects of PM on meteorology are important to explaining these extreme pollution events, then brown carbon would have an important impact. And that's because brown carbon is the absorbing portion of organic carbon, and it uh, may play a really important role in driving these PM events by essentially stabilizing uh, the planetary boundary layer and helping to cut down on dry convection because you have a lot of black carbon and brown carbon in the upper atmosphere and that just basically slows down the winds and P PM can start to build up. Uh, and so what I'm showing here is the same time period, so simultaneous uh, measurements of brown carbon with those other PM components. Um, and this is in terms of the imaginary refractive index, which is how they often measure brown carbon. And so this imaginary refractive index is a, essentially you can think of it as a proxy for absorption, and it's normalized by concentration. So it's the absorption of the material itself. Um, and brown carbon is now put into GSChem, um, which was derived from satellite estimates from OMI. And if we use that level of the imaginary refractive index, you would get that blue line constantly throughout the whole time period. Um, and different fuels, different lab measurements have shown different absorption for different types of fuels. So parameterization for biomass burning shows those red dots. Uh, coal is higher, diesel is higher, but then you notice the brown carbon absorption for uh, China is much higher than all of that, especially during these peak times, and also very variable. And so there are a couple reasons why that could be. One could be just that emissions are changing, and so if you have different mixes of brown carbon from different sources, that could be varying the total absorption. Um, there could also be secondary brown carbon formation, and then finally there can be this idea of photo bleaching, which is something that was proposed in the Seekers aircraft campaign, whereas um, time goes on, light starts hitting the brown carbon, and it degrades. So taking the values of uh, the imaginary refractive index, we can start to try and get an estimate of the total AAOD in China um, during this time period. And so uh, what I've done here is taken the GSChem mass columns of black carbon and organic carbon, and we don't know the column measurements, but we have a good match, if you remember, for the surface at least. Um, and then putting in the black line here is, a, I think, 11.5 meter squared per gram, which was a common value used in papers looking at black carbon and GSChem in terms of the mass absorption. And then the gray shading around the black is some of the uncertainty, depending on whether you assume black carbon is internally mixed or externally mixed and how absorbing it is. Um, the brown line is taking those imaginary refractive index values that were measured and combining it with the GSChem column information. And then the blue line is taking if we took what the uh, current values for the imaginary refractive index in GSChem are and just attached it to the column values. And you can see that this can make a big difference. And so the brown carbon in China, um, depending on the assumptions, could be some days up to 50% of absorption. Um, that was the extreme, but on average, it would at least make up about 30% of absorption if you use these in situ uh, measurements of absorption, whereas it made up 16% of absorption about if you just use the um, OMI-derived values. So moving forward, our next steps are to try and understand what's going on with nitrate. And so examine the importance of this increased nitrate removal, um, such as things that have been discussed, uh, or look at the effect of emissions, which seem to be a difference between previous studies, and then use the data that we have to try and constrain black carbon and brown carbon estimates across China with GSChem to get meteorological information, which we can then use to determine some climate information and the climate effects. Uh, thank you. So the question was, have I looked at the aerosol pH? And I have not. This was just as kind of out of the box. So I haven't, I haven't checked that yet. That's a good thing to check, though. So you have a slide uh, showing the time series of the emerging part of the drum index. Uh, you said where, where, where did you measure that? How did you measure that? So this was measured uh, near Tsinghua University, and what they do is they take uh, the filter of organic carbon and they dissolve the organic carbon, and this one is in methanol. And then they shine a light through the methanol and normalize it by the concentration, both in the dissolved organic carbon and then back to the filter to try and figure out what the concentration is, uh, absorption would be. So this is 
not from, uh, I guess, the measuring total absorption and backing it out, is actually measuring the absorption of the dissolved organics. So that measuring the surrounding Yes, yeah. Okay, so kind of the yes, yeah. So the question was about nitrate bias and organic inhibition, and I'm not sure that's something that I need to talk to Rachel about. Um, but that could certainly also be an issue. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Our next speaker is uh, Guangneng Geng uh, from uh, Emory University. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'll talk about the chemical composition of ambient PM 2.5 over China during the time period from 2005 to 2012 and the relationship to precursor emissions. Uh, it is well known that China is facing severe PM 2.5 pollution, and the Chinese government has uh, taken actions to mitigate precursor emissions, mainly on SO2 and NOx. And since we have taken take the actions to reduce emissions, uh, we, we are very curious about the PM 2.5 variations uh, in the past time. And so how is the PM 2.5 concentration variation in the past and how is the PM 2.5 species varies in the past, those are answer, Those are questions need to be answered. Uh, in in this study, I use different type of data set to try to answer this question. First, uh, I summarized ground measurements from literatures because in the study time period du during uh, 2005 to 2012, there were no available national monitoring network data in China. So I have to uh, collect, uh, uh, collect observation data from different groups. Um, the second data side is uh, the starlight-based PM2.5 compensation and concentrations estimated from satellite AOD data and the geoscan model. Uh, these data sites are derived following previous studies using satellite AOD from MODIS and MISA instrument and the conversion factors modeled by GeoScan between PM2.5 component and modeled AOD. Also, I uh, took the bottom-up emission information from MEG model developed by Tsinghua University to try to examine the emission driving forces behind the the, the PM 2.5 concentration changes. Here shows the evaluation of the satellite derived PM 2.5 compensation concentration data. Uh, in general, the satellite derived data shows good great agreement with the observations cl collected from publications. And uh, the nitrate and ammonia a little overestimated. I think that this is con consistent to previous studies encountered in GeoScan Geos model. Uh, here shows the multi-year spatial distribution of PM2.5 and PM2.5 species. Uh, hot spot can be found in those regions with large populations like uh, the North China Plain, the Sichuan Basin and uh, Hunan Hubei provinces. And PM 2.5 compositions can show quite different, uh, uh, sh uh, show similar spatial patterns with PM 2.5, uh, total PM 2.5, but the hotspot may differ in different species. 
Um, but for dust and sea salt, which comes from natural sources, the spatial patterns can be quite different. Uh, this slide shows the PM 2.5 spati spatiation for 20 major cities across China. Uh, from both observations and the satellite-derived data. I think the PM2.5 spatiation pattern can be well captured by satellite-derived data. For example, the city with largest uh, SN fraction is, is observed in Qinghai Lake. Uh, from the satellite perspective, it is also in that city. And um, here shows the temporal variation in PM2.5 concentrations. We can see that the national population weighting mean PM2.5 concentration in China increased from 2005 to 2007, and then start to decrease. If you see the uh, annual concentration mean, there is a slight rebound in the year of 2011. We also see the PM2.5 concentration trend in uh, three selected regions that cover most of the hotspot in China. And it is the ECN region, PRD, and Sichuan Basin, SCB. Um, here shows the temporal variation in PM2.5 compositions. Uh, the organic matter and black carbon shows quite steady trend. Uh, it means it is, n there's no, no upwards trend. And the dust and sea salt, which comes from natural sources, uh, is uh, fluctuate during the steady time period. But for sulfate and nitrate, we can see uh, clearly um, downwind and upwind trend separately. So we believe that the sulfate and nitrate are two major species that drove the PM, drove the trend in total PM 2.5. The decrease in the sulfate concentration drove the PM, total PM 2.5 to decrease, and the increase in the nitrate concentration uh, drove the PM 2.5 to rebound in the uh, from uh, 2011. Uh, here shows the annual mean of the uh, SN concentration in China and the three selected regions. Um, for PRD, it has quite different different trend with uh, with the whole China and other other two selected regions. The the nitrate the nitrate trend is uh, the, the nitrate growth rate is less than other regions in PRD. Um, to to find the driving forces behind those changes, we compare the uh, emission change rates with the relative change in um, sulfate and nitrate concentrations. In general, the changes in sulfate and nitrate concentrations were in line with the changes in, in their precursor emissions, that is SO2 and NOx emissions. The growth rate rates might be different. Uh, I think it's caused by the uh, thermodynamic equilibrium between S and A. Uh, here shows the emission trends in different sectors taken from make inventory. We also set up a hap hypothetical uh, scenario to separate the changes from emission factor and activities. The yellow bar shows the uh, emission changes due to activity change only, and the green bar shows the emission changes due to the emission factor changes. Um, for SO2, the decrease in SO2 emission 
mainly caused by the in, in the power sector. Because uh, uh, we start, uh, the Chinese government start to uh, install uh, FGD device in power plant from uh, 2005, which caused the SO2 emissions to decrease. But for NOx emissions, uh, there are there were limited control control uh, measures in the power plant section, and for the industrial sector. Uh, it, uh, the emission factor even increased, which is because in the salmon pro, uh, in the salmon production, the Chinese government um, changed the salmon kings to increase emission to increase energy efficiency, but resulted in higher emission factors. And we also summarize the region-specific emission changes in different sectors, which can help us to understand the PM 2.5 trend differences in different regions. Uh, I think the time is limited, so I won't talk mu much about it. So um, that's it. I'm happy to take question questions. Uh, the organic carbon chain emissions. Uh, there, there are not that much changes in organic, the primary organic carbon, because uh, uh, I don't think there are uh, actions to control organic uh, carbon emissions. Sorry. Uh, it has little changes, but not, not not that much. Not as much as uh, NOx and SO2. Okay, next, next question is, what geological fields were used for this emission? Uh, it's JUICE 5. JUICE 5 uh, for uh, the next grade JUICE can model. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Rui Jin Ni from Peking University. <laughs> Uh, hello everyone, I'm Rui Jinyi, a PhD student from Peking University. Uh, today my talk is focused on the contribution of different regions and spogenic emission uh, to springtime uh, ozone over China. And um, uh, recent years, much attention has been paid to uh, China's air pollution and uh, especially for the PM pollution, just as, uh, as uh, Guan Nan mentioned. Um, but the fact is that uh, we now uh, face a serious ozone pollution in China. And this picture shows the observed uh, maximum hourly ozone in the big cities of China. So we can see that in Beijing, uh, Guangdong, and uh, uh, Hong Kong, the max hourly ozone even exceeds 200 ppb. Uh, but the uh, um, ozone-related studies in China uh, are really scar uh, scarcely, so the source of ozone in China is still unclear. Uh, we want to use JOSCAM to help us to quantify the ozone contribution um, of the anthropogenic emissions uh, in different regions. And first of all, we need to evaluate the model. Uh, here we use the version 9 just came uh, to a coupling system um, with the nested domain of East Asia uh, with resolution of half degree. And uh, we compared the model's uh, results with observations showing in this picture. Uh, we use uh, several kinds of um, observations, all the ob observations to evaluate, and the uh, evaluation job is um, not that easy for me, because you, you all know that uh, the observation in US is very rich, but before uh, 2040, the observations of China is uh, quite rare. So uh, I even need to find some uh, observations from the, uh, the literature. 
And here uh, I use some of the um, um, global uh, background stations, uh, such as Shangri-La and Waliguan. Uh, and also I use uh, regional background stations from uh, WODC in China and the surrounding area. We also use some aircraft data from Mosaic and the uh, ozone sound data to indicate the vertical profile of ozone from WODC and also some uh, surface measurements from uh, EA nets. And as the example showing here, we can see that geoscam can well simulate the ozone's uh, concentration and with very low bios, uh, less than 5%, and it can also um, uh, ca uh, capture the day-to-day -day variations with, with very high correlation. And uh, what what's is um, exceed my uh, expression is that uh, geoscam can well capture the vertical profile quite well, and, uh, but it always overestimates the ozone in the atmosphere uh, by up to 10%. And then we uh, separate the whole world into these eight uh, regions uh, to uh, quantify the ozone um, over China contributed by these eight uh, regions as pathogenic emissions uh, by using the zero out uh, methods. And uh, next, I will show you some very interesting um, results. And this panel shows uh, the spatial distribution of ozone related to China's uh, own aspergenic emissions. Uh, and we can see that in North China plan, the domestic aspergenic emissions even cause the reduction of ozone due to too much NOx uh, uh, emitted in our spring, uh, which can separate the ozone product. Uh, pro product productivity and uh, can even react with ozone. And this picture shows uh, the ozone contributed by the foreign aspergenic emissions. We can see that uh, the aspergenic emissions of, uh, of foreign enhanced China's surface ozone by 3 to 12 uh, PBB. This is quite a big number. It's nearly about 20% of the surface ozone. And uh, this picture shows the um, um, percentage contribution of uh, foreign contributions to the total aspergenic emissions. Uh, as we can see here in Western China and the uh, Northern China, this place where uh, the local aspergenic emissions is uh, relatively low. And in this place, uh, nearly 60% and even more percent ozone, uh, aspergenic ozone are related to uh, foreign contribution. And uh, we can see, and, and uh, the um, Ozone uh, contributed by uh, different regions shows quite different pattern. Here I list uh, uh, these four major uh, regions. And we can see that in uh, the contribution from Southeast Asia and South Asia mainly affects south of China. And it can enhance the ozone over um, um, Tibet and Yunnan province by uh, 2 PBB, even to, uh, 10, uh, even to 10 PBB. And the uh, contribution from Europe and North America, the surface ozone of China by up to 2 PBB in the uh, northern China. And this amount is nearly half uh, of the amount that the ozone transport from East Asia to uh, North America. And but we can see uh, the place here in China, uh, there is much more uh, population and copland. So maybe the ozone transports from uh, North America to, uh, to Asia to, uh, to East Asia, is, uh, the effect on the health and copelands is even larger. And we are also interested in the vertical uh, contribution of uh, the different places uh, 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 on uh, ozone over China. So uh, I put the picture here. The black line indicates the ozone over China contributed by the domestic aspergenic emissions. And the green line here indicates the uh, ozone over China contributed by foreign aspergenic uh, emissions. As we can see, it's obvious above the PBL, maybe uh, two uh, kilometers height, uh, the contribution from foreign uh, aspergenic emissions even exceeds the domestic contribution. And uh, this picture shows the percentage contribution uh, of different regions. Well, well, and 
the uh, shows the percentage contribution of different regions uh, um, uh, to the total anthropogenic emission. So we can see that from the uh, surface to the aptosphere, uh, the foreign contribution um, contributes 40% um, to 90% of the total anthropogenic emission over China, and the contribution increased with heights. And um, we all know that China is a uh, secondary uh, air pollution in the uh, atmosphere. And so uh, the transportation of uh, ozone is a little more complicated compar com compared to other um, tracers. So uh, we, can, we all know that uh, first uh, the precursors of ozone will be uh, emitted from the source region and then contribute uh, and then formulates ozone. Then this part of ozone will be transported to um, uh, the downwind area to uh, maybe in China and the second part uh, of ozone um, transport is happened uh, like that the precursors first be emitted and then be transported to the downwind area to formulate uh, pen and during the transport pathway, pen will be um, de uh, decomposition to uh, NOx and the reaction with VOC to, com uh, to formulate ozone. Then this part of ozone will transport to uh, China. So we uh, want to separate these two uh, process of uh, the ozone um, transport. So we use the tech uh, ozone model here uh, um, to help us to understand these two process. And uh, this picture shows the um, ratios of uh, the ozone produced direct over the source region uh, to the total ozone uh, transported to uh, the uh, to China. So as uh, we uh, can see, the green line shows here. Uh, is, this is indicates the. Um, contribution of the ozone produ produced directly over the source region uh, of the total um, con contributed by the total uh, foreign areas uh, to the total uh, ozone contributed over China. So we can see that uh, more than half of the ozone um, transported to China is formulated during the transport pathway. Uh, okay. Um, this is my uh, uh, summary, and uh, let me stop here, uh, and the questions are welcome. Yeah. So the contributions you shared are a lot smaller than the 200 ppm above that you shared in the first slide? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, I didn't hear clearly the, the, the questions you mentioned. So what are the conditions that are driving the 200 ppm greater? Uh, yes. Um, uh, you mentioned a very um, important question that's the meteor uh, me 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 meteorology conditions is very important. Uh, but um, the well, in a different way, whether the model can capture that, that such high ozone episodes. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Indeed, model uh, cannot uh, capture that high uh, events. Um, that, uh, that's high concentration of ozone. Oh uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We can discuss uh, offline. Any other questions? Okay, our next speaker is uh, Xiao Meng Qing uh, from Columbia University. Hello, I'm Xiao Meng Jing. I'm a graduate student working with Professor Alin Ferry at Columbia University. So I'm interested in using satellite data to look at the chemistry of secondary air pollutants and using models to interpret information that we could gain from space. So as for today, I'd like to share the story about how we use a space-based indicator to look at the surface ozone sensitivity to create precursor emissions and how this indicator could be applied to inform the emission control strategies. 
So the surface ozone is a secondary air pollutant, and the main source of surface ozone over urban areas is the photochemical reactions between two classes of ozone precursors, NOx and the VOCs, in the presence of sunlight. So the ozone production is somehow dependent on the relative availability of NOx and the VOCs. Back in 1995, Silman proposed some secondary species as indicators of NOx and the VOCs. Two of them that are most interested are nitrogen dioxide and formaldehyde. So not only because these two species are proportional to the abundance of NOx and the reactivity within the VOCs, but also because they can be measured from space. So some following studies applied this indica indicator approach to satellite observed tropospheric column density of nitrogen dioxide and formaldehyde. And they have shown that when the ratio of the formaldehyde to nitrogen dioxide is higher than two, the ozone formation is usually NOx limited, meaning that it would be more effective to control NOx emissions. And when the ratio is lower than one, the ozone formation is usually VOC limited or NOx saturated, meaning that it would be more effective to control VOC emissions. So this is where the idea of our study came from. So however, this very simple indicator has a lot of uncertainties. So my, my purpose of our talk today is to discuss three major sources of uncertainties. First, the regime threshold values, the one and two, may not be constant. And second, the column densities measured by the space and in instruments may not represent the near surface environment. And third, the satellite sensors have a lot of errors, so the observation errors, if large enough, could lead to some misclassification of the ozone production regime. Okay, so using two emission perturbation simulations in GeoScan that reduce NOx and VOC emissions by 20%, we analyzed how the ozone responds to the emission reduction as a function of the surface indicator ratio and the column-based indicator ratio. And then we derived the regime threshold values, assuming that if the, the ozone over DE NOx is, uh, is negative, the ozone formation is NOx saturated. And if the, uh, the, the, the ozone over DE NOx is, uh, is, uh, is positive and is higher than the ozone over DE VOC, the ozone formation is usually VOC limited, uh, is NOx limited. And so um, using this method, we derived the regime threshold values for different regions. What we found is that if we were to use the surface ratio as an indicator of the ozone sensitivity, the regime threshold values are very consistent across different regions, all occur between 0.4 and 0.9. But if we were to use column-based indicator ratio, we found that the regime threshold values may actually be different for different regions, as you can see from this table. So this leads to a second source of uncertainty, that is, the column and the surface are not an apple to apple comparison. So I analyzed the column to surface relationships of nitrogen dioxide, formaldehyde, and the indicator ratio in the model. So we found that the column to surface relationship of the nitrogen dioxide in the model is, is correlated with the planetary boundary layer height. But there is no such correlation for formaldehyde. As a result, taking the ratio of the formaldehyde to nitrogen dioxide does not cancel out the boundary layer dependence of the indicator ratio, so which means that the column to surface relationship of the indicator ratio is not constant across, uh, um, uh, is not constant, and it is various in space and time, and it is also inversely correlated with the planetary boundary layer height. So the way we adjust this is to take the model, the column to surface scaling factor of the indicator ratio to adjust the more robust and the consistent regime threshold values of the surface indicator ratio. So this gave us a set of the regime threshold values that varies in both space and time. So once we figured out the proof of concept from the model, the so next question is how well do the satellite data perform and how do they agree with the model? So I, um, I, 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 use both, uh, I use satellite retrieval products from both NASA and TAMIS, which gave us four combinations of different indicator ratios. And we found that using different satellite retrievals, they actually give us very different answers about the ozone sensitivity, especially during the spring and the fall regime transition period. As we can see from this seasonal cycle of the, um, regime of the indicator ratio over New York City region. And then we have done some extensive comparison between the model and the satellite data. So I'm not going to show you the statistics here, but the main, the, the main story here is that the spatial and the temporal correlation between the model and the satellite depends on which auto product we choose. And the main bias or the main difference depends on which format product we choose to use. So the second phase of our study is just to take advantage of the decadal record of the ozone um, satellite data to look at the evolution of ozone sensitivity over the past decade. 
So for the interest of time, I will only, only talk about the northeastern US. So over the northeastern US, because of the success of the emission control that drives down the NOx level, there has been an increase in trend of the indicated ratio, so, um, which means that the ozone formation over northeastern US is becoming more and more sensitive to NOx emissions. So as we can see from this time series of the indicated ratio over the oxidated region, we found that the um, re regime tra regime transition in spring to the NOx limited regime um, shifted at least one month earlier from 2005 to 2015. So this actually got some interest from the air quality managers um, in, because this just gave them a piece of observation-based evidence showing that their regional NOx emission programs should be effective and maybe even more effective than it would be, say, 10 years ago. Okay, so to briefly summarize, to just summarize, even though the column-based increase ratio may not represent the, um, the survey, near surface environment, but with the help of the model, we could actually use the satellite data to look at the um, variations of the ozone NOx and VOC sensitivity. And uh, I also showed that there has been incre increase in NOx sensitivity over the most US, US cities. So even though I didn't show other regions, so we also found this increasing NOx sensitivity over Europe, Japan, Korea, and the three mega cities in China, including Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. And, uh, but I also have to emphasize here is that there are still large uncertainties with satellite data, especially at the daily scale. And the satellite data may, uh, may also uh, may be unable to reveal the ozone chemistry at the urban cores, which I think will benefit from the geostationary satellite under development. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I think this is a really good point. And uh, um, but for this, but, but for this study, we cannot say how the uh, NOx inc increase could affect the nonlinearities of the chemistry. But I think it is something that we could definitely look into. Yeah, so in our study, we filtered out the pixels that are affected by the row anomalies. But it's true that because after 2011, there are some, a lot of uh, de um, OMI degradation, degradation issues. And so this could be something that we need to think about. But for this, for this part, I'm, using only, I'm only using the monthly average data, so, which does not um, affect much on the row anomalies. Yeah, I think it should be something due to the um, vertical gradient and maybe different source of the of, of a model high and natural dioxide. And it, I think it also depends on the um, the boundary layer mixing scheme we use in the model. So in this in this model, we use a well mixed boundary boundary layer mixing scheme. But if we choose a different um, different boundary layer scheme, for example, the non local mixing scheme, maybe it will give a different answers. So I think it's model dependent somehow. Okay. Uh Thank you. Now, uh, last talk uh, goes to uh, KD Travis from Harvard. <coughs> have the PDF. What to do for the PDF? Yeah. So I'm going to bring everything back to the southeast U.S. Um, so here I'm showing a surface comparison of MD8 ozone in the southeast U.S. where we have incredible model measurement disagreements that we've had for a really long time. Um, this is a multi-model comparison from Arlene Fiore in 2009 from January to December showing mean MD8 ozone in black and then the uh, mean model comparison. Um, in the dashed black line you can see in the summertime peaking around August we have an incredible bias that appears. Um, this has been attributed to uncertainties in ozone NOx VOC chemistry because this is a region of incredibly high isoprene emission. Um, also things like um, isoprene emissions themselves, isoprene nitrates, ozone deposition, even inflow from the Gulf has been blamed. Um, recent studies have these biases, so this is a continuing problem. And of course, this is of concern for the design of, of ozone regulations. Um, there's plenty of exceedances in this region to deal with. 
So we beat down a lot of these uncertainties with the Seekers aircraft campaign that happened in August and September 2013 coming out of Houston. So here I'm showing um, from 0 to 12 kilometers aircraft in black, model in red, comparisons of unique tracers of ice pre-oxidation. Um, for the first time, we're explicitly modeling things like the hydroproxy aldehyde that recycles OH in the low NOx um, regions. Jenny Fisher did a lot of work on constraining our isoprene nitrate yield and the recycling of NOx um, based on uh, recent lab studies of how much NOx comes out of this. We don't think that things like isoprene nitrates or um, the low NOx chemistry is really contributing anymore to incredible biases in our model. Um, on the top, I'm showing NOx, nitric acid, and ozone. Um, from our NOx comparisons, we found a huge overestimate of about 40% in NOx. And recent study, uh, previous studies had found in a regional sense that mobile source emissions from the NEI inventory were really overestimated by 50% or more. And so we applied this correction to our NEI inventory, so we cut the inventory in half. And we found a much better agreement with NOx, so that's going from this dashed red model simulation to the uh, solid red model simulation has also improved our simulation of ozone and our simulation of NOx reservoirs like nitric acid. We confirmed this finding using observations of wet deposition across the entire United States, um, where we have rain information at least. Um, this led to a 10 ppb uh, decrease at the surface of MDA ozone, although we still have remaining bias that we'll get to in a minute. Um, this also led to a much better simulation of ozone production efficiency in the boundary layer that we um, inferred from aircraft. So we have a successful NOx simulation and a successful ozone simulation from aircraft from Seekers, and I'm showing here a probability distribution. Um, it's the same aircraft I showed be before, but now in a PDF format, where we have good agreement in the upper part of the boundary layer um, against aircraft, but then if we look to the surface, um, at MD8 CASNET observations, I'm showing maps here showing that they're regionally co-located. We have a large bias that still remains against uh, uh, from the model to the observations. And you can see there's also this implied gradient in the boundary layer of about 10 ppb, which is really surprising from the aircraft down to the surface. So we remain biased. We're also not symmetrically biased. We're missing more in the low tail. And the entire PDF is actually quite low, which surprised us. Um, there's only one exceedance of the 70 ppb ambient air quality standard in, this, uh, in 2013 during this time period compared to almost uh, 25 in 2011. And I'll talk about in a minute uh, why I think that might be. So this implied gradient, though, suggests that we should really be correcting um, model ozone from the lowest model grid point of about 60 meters um, down to the measurement altitude of CASNET, which has been done for other species like nitric acid, um, which is about 10 meters. So here I'm showing a schematic from uh, Danielle's new textbook, um, going from, <laughs> uh, I think it's not out yet, uh, but soon. <laughs> Is it? Yeah, anyway, um, so how we take in the model uh, ozone from the model, uh, or any species from the lowest model grid point um, down to 10, uh, uh, sorry, down to the surface, down to the canopy, and we can pull out of the formulation of the aerodynamic resistance a correction factor to correct ozone down to 10 meters. And we find that this, of course, matters more when the aerodynamic resistance is higher. And so for MDA ozone, we actually get a 3 ppb correction, which if you're trying to fight for 10 ppb in the southeast US is, is significant. Um, it's probably something that should be a standard diagnostic in the model. Um, and other people who are doing MDA might, ozone might want to um, uh, do this in their studies. Um, so we shift the PDF over by 3 ppb, but we still have a problem. So the entire PDF was low, as I showed uh, a couple slides before. Um, and so you can see that there's a lot of interannual variability in MDA ozone. This is going over the CASNET record from 1987 to 2015, um, where the decline is due to emission reductions, but the interannual variability is more due to meteorology. Um, 2013 was a cool and wet year. It wasn't a huge outlier, but it was cooler and wetter than average. It was also cloudier than average. And so we asked the question, how do these meteorological conditions challenge model scaling capturing MD8 ozone? So we do this by separating these uh, probability distribution functions of MDA ozone at the surface um, by sky conditions. So I have observations of low cloud from nearby airports, and I'm separating out that data in blue. These are the observations. This is the model. And then I have rain observations um, from PRISM, and I'm separating out that data in green. And then the clear days are shown in black. And so you can see that rainy days really challenge the model. The model really fails on rainy days. This could be due to stratification from evaporative cooling. We're still working on why this might be. Um, uh, there's a, a strong cloud response in the observations, and we only capture about half of that in the model. And then on the clear days, we're doing really well. And if I overlaid these PDFs, we'd have a really beautiful comparison um, on the clear days. 
Um, so we think we can attribute this low tail that we were missing uh, to cloudy and mainly rainy conditions. Um, but then the weak response of the model to cloud cover is something that we're investigating further with ozone sons from the Huntsville, um, Alabama ozone sun, which is representative of the southeast US. Oh, and I should also say that we're missing some low cloud in the model. Um, uh, I have a, a probably too high of an estimate. Um, after talking to GMAO earlier this morning, we're probably missing 20 or 30 percent of low cloud, but we can't just correct for that because our model response to cloud is too weak. Um, this is also something that's been found in other models where CMAC seems to also have this problem. Um, so looking at the Huntsville ozone sand, here I'm showing a map in in time and in altitude of the observ observed and modeled ozone throughout the free troposphere up to 12 kilometers, and we do a really good job. And then this is the mean. But then if we zoom in on the lowest three kilometers, um, we see that the ozone sons are confirming this gradient that we find between the aircraft observations and the surface of about 10 PBB. So here's the mean, which is easier to look at from, this is two kilometers down to the surface. You can see this gradient, and the model is flat. And um, uh, I suppose if you stare at this, you can also see the same thing in the daily uh, sons. And we find that on cloudy days, this gradient is the strongest, and it's more well mixed on the clear days. And again, after talking to GMAO, uh, what we think is happening is that the clouds are not optically thick enough. They're letting too much heat through. We have too strong boundary layer mixing on cloudy days, um, and probably too much ozone production as well. And so we think we've finally traced the rest of the surface ozone bias in the southeast to cloudy conditions, um, possibly due to not enough cloud cover and then too weak of a response to cloud cover. OK, so uncertainties in the southeast US have really been beat down by seekers, by better ice spring chemistry, by better NOx emissions. Um, the NOx emissions inventory um, is something that's being worked on by EPA. It's a really big problem for modeling ozone potentially across the US. Um, the model's still biased, and we think we've traced that to um, cloudy conditions. Um, we're still working on the failure under rainy conditions, and then this weak response of the model to cloud cover. So thanks. We have time for a few questions. So we don't treat cloud-driven turbulence in the geoschem boundary layer mixing scheme. So we're using the non-local scheme, and that's entirely um, it's a pretty strong function of the sensible heat flux. So whether there could be something going on not just driven by the bottom-up heating, but also by the cloud-driven turbulence is something I'm not entirely sure about. Um, it'd be really great to get some more information from GMAO about the effects of that um, on boundary layer mixing in uh, the GS model. Well, so we only have bromine in the model. I haven't actually tested with it without bromine. Um, that would really help if we had too much inflow coming in from the Gulf. And we don't find that that's a significant problem anymore. Um, I think I could get another couple of PPB out of iodine. I'm not sure that um, that's certain enough to really say that it's part of this bias. And it really wouldn't solve anything about this gradient that we find. Yeah, so we found during Seegers that the floods over the Gulf were not biased. Um, on the rainy days, we are getting inflow from the Gulf, so that's a little bit of a contradiction. It's something we're still looking into. Yes, Chris. Do your uh, do comparisons of water vapor and potential temperature support the interpretation about there being too much mixing on um, cloudy days? Yeah, so we don't have an, quite enough data to be totally statistically significant. I've only got 30 sons and splitting them into cloudy clear. I don't have a lot left over where the model and the data match, and that's something we're still working on, on trying to, to nail down. It, it implies but doesn't totally nail down that that's what's going on. But we do know that the clouds are, we do know for sure that the clouds are not thick enough and are letting too much heat through, so that would definitely suggest that. Any more questions? There are a few dry conversations in So we have scaled up dry ozone dry deposition to match. Um, we've reduced the surface resistance by 20% based on work that Patrick did to match um, Duke Forest measurements. Um, so that would be a couple PPB. And we've um, changed the dry deposition scheme to match um, measurements of oxygenated VOCs um, based on SOAS. That doesn't really affect ozone very much. Um, 
we don't have enough data to say if there's more variability that we're not capturing that could be significant. But again, that wouldn't that wouldn't impact, impact our gradient problems either. So. Okay. Uh, thank you. Now we have the thirty second and the post terms. Do I start? Okay. Um, so clouds and aerosols, we know, interact via a complex web of physical processes um, that, so, such that both influence each other. Um, so we've heard from some people over the course of the conference about how aerosols impact clouds. Uh, but my poster is about the opposite problem, how clouds impact aerosols, and the extent to which cloud micro, micro and macro physical properties can explain aerosol concentrations and speciation on the ground. Uh, so stop by my poster if you're interested. OK. Hi, everyone. My name is Seungan Lee from Seoul National University. Uh, we conducted multimodal air quality forecast in East Asia to support aircraft measurement during cross AQ campaign. And after the mission, we evaluated the models with surface and urban measurement. And the results are presented in the poster. So please come and see my poster, C21. Thanks. Hi, I'm Dan, and uh, I'm talking about fires. So at the end of the rice harvest season in northwestern India, the farmers burn their crops to get ready for the wheat harvest, subsequent wheat harvest. And these fires are visible from space. Um, the question we have, are there enough fires visible from space? When we model this, we get a big underestimate. And it's a big deal because just downwind of these fires is the city of Delhi, which is home of 20 million people. So come to my poster. We'll talk some more about fire emission inventories. And it's my birthday today. So. <laughs> Uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Matt Jolly from uh, uh, University of Edinburgh, and I'll be presenting some uh, initial results from my uh, my somewhat formative involvement in the um, air pollution and human health in a Chinese mega city uh, project. Um, it had been claimed that this is uh, possibly the uh, the largest urban uh, air pollution uh, field campaign in history. But I haven't seen the talk on Course AQ earlier. I think I should probably uh, retract that statement. Um, but anyway, sort of going forward, I'll be um, focusing on model measurement comparison for new and existing data sets uh, from APHH and uh, OMI uh, for model high column retrievals. Cheers. Hi, I'm Regin Dan from the Institute of the Atmospheric Physics. Uh, as we know, the severe winter heat has become a serious problem in China in recent years. And so here we simulate the PM2.5 in China from 1980 to 2015 to see the long-term variations of the frequency and intensity of the severe winter heat. And furthermore, we discuss the uh, emission reduction measure, the effects of it on the uh, severe winter heat. And for more information, welcome to my poster. Hi, it's Mickey Joe from Peking University. When the impact of emission control and that of meteorological variations interact with each other, how can we differentiate their independent role in improving regional air quality? Through modern through model comparison and sensitivity test, our preliminary work has given us an answer. If you are seeking for the same answers as us, please feel free to come to C25. Thank you. Hello guys. We implement four reactions happen on aerosol surface into the JOSCAM model, and we have got some results. As you can see, the production of the sulfate rate has increased 32, 17, 5, and 5 percent. So if you are interested on it, just come here and talk with me. The poster is, say, 26. Thank you. Hi, we, um, we are assessing the European nested model, um, comparing two observations on the surface. Um, we're looking at, um, um, sorry, we're looking at um, different contributions that um, make up PM2.5 and seeing if the model um, captures that well. We're also doing daily, seasonal, and temporal evaluations of the model. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Chen Hao from the University of Iowa. So um, previous study has shown there is a long range transport of dust from uh, East Asia to North America. However, well, when we downscale our study from the global scale to regional scale or even uh, urban scale, uh, such an effect should not be neglected and we must consider it in uh, our simulation. So during my first year study, um, I've been uh, working on developing a code uh, for providing WolfCAM with boundary conditions from GeoScan uh, we conducted uh, a test, does the test case, and hopefully, uh, and we will conduct some evaluation. Hopefully, this tool could be used by the community. If you have any questions, just stop by at 28. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Sally from University of Houston. So have you ever known the biomass burning in uh, Central America region will impact the air quality over the southeastern U.S.? I think maybe you are not live in southeastern U.S., but People we live in Texas, we do care about this issue. So uh, we use <laughs> Joe's can try to quantify the impact. So welcome to spot my poster, uh, C29. Thanks.